Chapter Eight of the Prodigal Village: A Christmas Tale by Irving Bacheller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight, in which Judge Crooker delivers a few opinions. The pride of Bingville had fallen in the dust. It had arisen and gone on with soiled garments and lowered head. It had suffered derision and defeat. It could not ever be the same again. Sneed and Snodgrass recovered, in a degree, from their feelings of opulence. Sneed had become polite, industrious, and obliging. Snodgrass and others had lost heavily in stock speculation through the failure of a broker in Hazelmead. They went to work with a will, and without the haughty independence, which for a time had characterized their attitude. The spirit of the little shepherd had entered the hearts and home of Emmanuel Baker and his wife. Pauline and the baby were there and being tenderly loved and cared for. But what humility had entered that home! Phyllis and her husband lived with her parents, Gordon having taken a humble place in the mill. He worked early and late. The Bings had made it hard for him, finding it difficult to overcome their resentment, but he stood the gaff, as they say, and won the regard of J. Patterson, although Mrs. Bing could never forgive him. In June there had been a public meeting in the town hall addressed by Judge Crooker and the Reverend Mr. Singleton. The judge had spoken of the grinding of the mills of God that was going on the world over. Our civilization has had its time of trial not yet ended, he began. Its enemies have been busy in every city and village. Not only in the cities and villages of France and Belgium have they been busy, but in those of our own land. The Goths and Vandals have invaded Bingville. They have been destroying the things we loved. The false god is in our midst. Many here, within the sound of my voice, have a god suited to their own tastes and sins, an obedient, tractable, boneless god. It is my deliberate opinion that the dances and costumes and moving pictures we have seen in Bingville are doing more injury to civilization than all the guns of Germany. My friends, you can do nothing worse for my daughter than deprive her of her modesty, and I would rather, far rather, see you slay my son than destroy his respect for law and virtue and decency. The jazz band is to me a sign of spiritual decay. It is a step toward the jungle. I hear in it the beating of the tom-tom. It's not music. It is the barbaric yawp of sheer recklessness and daredevilism, and it is everywhere. Even in our economic life we are dancing to the jazz band, and with utter recklessness. American labor is being more and more absorbed in the manufacture of luxuries, embroidered frocks and elaborate millinery and limousines and laudelettes and rich upholstery and cord tires and golf courses and sporting goods and great country houses, so that there is not enough labor to provide the comforts and necessities of life. The tendency of all this is to put the stamp of luxury upon the commonest needs of man. The time seems to be near when a boiled egg and a piece of buttered bread will be luxuries, and a family of children an unspeakable extravagance. Let us face the facts. It is up to vanity to moderate its demands upon the industry of man. What we need is more devotion to simple living and the general welfare. In plain, old-fashioned English, we need the religion and simplicity of our fathers. Later, in June, a strike began in the big plant of J. Patterson Bing. The men demanded higher pay in shorter days. They were working under a contract, but that did not seem to matter. In a fight with scabs and Pinkerton men, they destroyed a part of the plant. Even the life of Mr. Bing was threatened. The summer was near its end when J. Patterson Bing and a committee of the labor union met in the office of Judge Crooker to submit their differences to that impartial magistrate for adjustment. The judge listened patiently and rendered his decision. It was accepted. When the papers were signed, Mr. Bing rose and said, Your Honor, there's one thing I want to say. I have spent most of my life in this town. I have built up a big business here and doubled the population. I have built comfortable homes for my laborers and taken an interest in the education of their children 
and built a library where any one could find the best books to read i have built playgrounds for the children of the working people if i have heard of any case of need i have done my best to relieve it i have always been ready to hear complaints and treat them fairly my men have been generously paid and yet they have not hesitated to destroy my property and to use guns and knives and clubs and stones to prevent the plant from filling its contracts and to force their will upon me how do you explain it what have i done or failed to do that has caused this bitterness mr bing i am glad that you asked me that question the old judge began it gives me a chance to present to you and to these men who work for you a conviction which has grown out of impartial observation of your relations with each other first i want to say to you mr bing that i regard you as a good citizen your genius and generosity have put this community under great obligation now in heading toward the hidden cause of your complaint i beg to ask you a question at the outset do you know that unfortunate son of the widow moran known as the shepherd of the birds i have heard much about him mr bing answered do you know him no i have had letters from him acknowledging favors now and then but i do not know him we have hit at once the source of your trouble the judge went on the shepherd is a representative person he stands for the poor and the unfortunate in this village you have never gone to see him because well probably it was because you feared that the look of him would distress you the thing which would have helped and inspired and gladdened his heart more than anything else would have been the feel of your hand and a kind and cheering word and sympathetic counsel under those circumstances i think i may say that it was your duty as a neighbor and a human being to go to see him instead of that you sent money to him now he never needed money in the kindest spirit i ask you if that money you sent to him in the best of good will was not in fact a species of bribery were you not indeed seeking to buy immunity from a duty incumbent upon you as a neighbor and a human being mr bing answered quickly there are plenty of people who have nothing else to do but carry cheer and comfort to the unfortunate i have other things to do that sir does not relieve you of the liabilities of a neighbor and a human being in my view if your business has turned you into a shaft or a cogwheel it has done you a great injustice i fear that it has been your master that it has practiced upon you a kind of despotism you would better get along with less far less business than suffer such a fate i don't want to hurt you we are looking for the cause of a certain result and i can help you only by being frank with all your generosity you have never given your heart to this village some unkind people have gone so far as to say that you have no heart you cannot prove it with money that you do not miss money is good but it must be warmed with sympathy and some degree of sacrifice has it never occurred to you that the warm hand and the cheering word in season are more vastly more than money in the important matter of making good will unconsciously you have established a line and placed yourself on one side of it and the people on the other broadly speaking you are capital and the rest are labor whereas in fact you are all working men some of the rest have come to regard you as their natural enemy they ought to regard you as their natural friend two kinds of despotism have prevented it first there is the despotism of your business in making you a slave so much of a slave that you haven't time to be human second there is the despotism of the labor union in discouraging individual excellence in demanding equal pay for the faithful man and the slacker and in denying the right of free men to labor when and where they will all this is tyranny as gross and un-american as that of george the third in trying to force his will upon the colonies if america is to survive we must set our faces against every form of tyranny the remedy for all our trouble and bitterness is real democracy which is nothing more or less than the love of men the love of justice and fair play for each and all you men should know that every strike increases the burdens of the people every day your idleness lifts the price of their necessity 
idleness is just another form of destruction why should you not have listened to the council of reason in june instead of in september and thus have saved these long months of loss and hardship and bitter violence it was because the spirit of tyranny had entered your heart and put your judgment in change it has blinded you to honor also for your men were working under contract if the union is to command the support of honest men it must be honest it was tyranny that turned the treaty with belgium into a scrap of paper that kind of a thing will not do here let me assure you that tyranny has no right to be in this land of ours you remind me of the prodigal son who had to know the taste of husks and the companionship of swine before he came to himself do you not know that tyranny is swine and the fodder of swine it is simply human hoggishness i have one thing more to say and i am finished mr bing some time ago you threw up your religion without realizing the effect that such an act would be likely to produce on this community you are no doubt aware that many followed your example i've got no preaching to do i'm just going to quote you a few words from an authority no less respectable than george washington himself our history has made one fact very clear namely that he was a wise and far-seeing man judge crooker took from a shelf john marshall's life of washington and read it is substantially true that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government and let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion let it simply be asked where is the security for property for reputation for life if a sense of religious obligation desert the oaths which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice let me add on my own account that the treatment you receive from your men will vary according to their respect for morality and religion they can manage very well with an irreligious master for you are only one but an irreligious mob is a different and highly serious matter believe me away back in the seventeenth century john dryden wrote a wise sentence it was this i have heard indeed of some very virtuous persons who have ended unfortunately but never of a virtuous nation providence is engaged too deeply when the cause becomes general if virtue is the price of a nation's life let us try to keep our own nation virtuous mr bing and his men left the judge's office in a thoughtful mood the next day judge crooker met the mill owner on the street judge i accept your verdict said the latter i fear that i have been rather careless it didn't occur to me that my example would be taken so seriously i have been a prodigal and have resolved to return to my father's house ho oh, servants said the judge with a smile bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry we shall have to postpone the celebration said mr bing i have to go to new york to-night and i sail for england to-morrow but i shall return before christmas a little farther on mr bing met hiram blenkinsop the latter had a plank on his shoulder i'd like to have a word with you said the mill owner as he took hold of the plank and helped hiram to ease it down i hear many good things about you mr blenkinsop i fear that we have all misjudged you if i have ever said or done anything to hurt your feelings i am sorry for it hiram blenkinsop looked with astonishment into the eyes of the millionaire i guess i ain't got your place right not exactly said he some folks ain't as good as they look and some ain't so bad as they look i wouldn't wonder if we was mostly pretty much alike come to shake us down let's be friends anyhow said mr bing if there's anything i can do for you let me know that evening as he sat by the stove in his little room over the garage of mr singleton with his dog christmas lying beside him mr blenkinsop fell asleep and awoke suddenly with a wild yell of alarm what's the matter a voice inquired mr blenkinsop turned and saw his old self standing in the doorway nothing but a dream said blenkinsop as he wiped his eyes 
dreamed i had a dog with a terrible thirst on him used to lead him around with a rope and when we come to a brook he'd drink it dry suddenly i felt an awful jerk on the rope that sent me up in the air and i looked and I see that the dog had turned into an elephant and that he was a goin like sam hill and that i was hitched to him and i couldn't let go once in a while he'd stop and drink a river dry and then he'd lay down and rest everybody was scared of the elephant and so was i and i'd try to cut the rope with my jackknife but it wouldn't cut it was so dull then all of a sudden he'd start on the run and twitch me over the hills and mounting and me taking steps a mile long and scared to death the fact is you're hitched to an elephant his old self remarked the first thing to do is to sharpen your jackknife it's night and silence that sets him going said blenkinsop when they come he's apt to start for the nighest river the old elephant is beginning to move blenkinsop put on his hat and hurried out of the door End of chapter eight